Hi people. So if I get a chance, I'm going to try and do a live stream too. I'm not going to set a time right now because um, I'm pretty busy these days, but uh, I would like to do a live stream fairly soon. So keep an eye out for that. Um, I want to talk about Afghanistan because this is really the main news story around right now. Um, it's uh, something that a lot of people have opinions on, something that's uh, produced understandably some quite strong opinions, particularly from people who have direct experience, uh, soldiers who have served out there and, uh, and others, Afghan civilians and um, probably journalists and other people who have direct experience of the country. Um, I'm going to show you something. I got this uh, the other day and I think it sort of summarises or at least uh, it's a visual image and an aesthetic, so to speak, of this whole episode of the fall of Kabul, the Taliban takeover. It's from the Economist newspaper. This is actually classed as a newspaper, though it's magazine format. Biden's debacle. You know, often presidents and leaders uh, generally get defined by one particular thing. Now, Biden's only been president for, what, six months? And uh, it's been an eventful period. Um, coronavirus, of course, is a huge thing that um, happened in both uh, Trump and Biden eras, um, thinking here of American politics or the American situation. But uh, I do think that these images from Kabul will be one of those that kind of mark the Biden presidency, rightly or wrongly. Much the way that uh, the Ford presidency was marked by the fall of Saigon. Um, I think that there's been some very fierce criticism of the president, and that's, I think, um, understandable, as the optics are not good. What we see is... Um, a very uh, rapid departure from a country that uh, the United States has been involved in 20 years, for 20 years, over 200,000 dead, um, you know, over 2,000 American service personnel have lost their lives. Many, many others will be suffering PTSD um, and it's something that there's very, it's very difficult to see any positive angle to this. Um, there's already news that a new insurgency has broken out against the Taliban in the Panjir region, which I understand is in the north. So um, the idea that the war will end as a result of this is not necessarily... I mean, the American fears, let's say, that 20-year period... Uh, just under 20 years, you know, November 2001, October 2001 to August 2021, it's kind of being classed as a conflict in its own right. So if you look at Wikipedia, the the war in Afghanistan, they're putting the end date to 15th of August 2021. But it's difficult to see Afghanistan suddenly getting stability. Um, and that's one of the great tragedies of Afghanistan. It's just had nothing but conflict, really, for 42 years. But, you know, in all the current optics, um, these traumatic scenes at Kabul airport of people literally clinging for their lives to American planes, um, just frenetic scenes. Um, there is a lot of talking points going on, and I think some of them are misplaced or unfair. I'm not talking so much about Biden. Um, I mean, one thing I don't like about Biden's approach is the, the, the totally dismissive way he's saying he's got no responsibility. He is president of the United States. Of course, he has responsibility. That's very flippant. And, um, you know, uh, if he's saying that Washington doesn't have a fundamental responsibility for the future of Afghanistan, that's one argument to make. But I still think it's quite flippant the way he said it. Um, although I haven't watched his formal speech yet, I'm talking about statements he made beforehand. Um, but, you know, there's an argument, uh, in, I guess, to be fair to Biden, that to what extent can the United States and another Western power stay in Afghanistan? At what point will it be too long? At what point would it have been? We're talking in past tense now. 
uh, the final point. I mean, the Afghan army have been trained for years. Millions have been invested. I do know, though, uh, senior British commanders who served in Afghanistan strongly reject the idea that the Afghan army uh, fled and ran. Um, they're quite defensive of their allies, understandably so. So we have to be a little bit careful not to just look at those outsiders and think, oh, they um, they just let the Taliban take over. Certainly, I think President Ghani has some explaining to do. I mean, he literally fled his country. Uh, perhaps his life was threatened. Um, but the optics were not good. Um, but, you know, there is a lot being said about this. What I think is absolutely galling is that Putin thinks he can lecture the West on Afghanistan. Um, I say that because Putin is a former KGB man. Now, so much of Afghanistan's problems began with the Soviet invasion, the Star Revolution and then the Soviet invasion. Because what that done was destabilised the country to an enormous extent. And uh, Afghanistan's had nothing but trouble since. I really think it's rich for Moscow to be pointing fingers and gloating about this. And I think we need to say so. Um, you know, RT um, Justin will not talk about the fact that for 10 years uh, it was the Soviet Vietnam. Uh, I believe it was 12,000 Soviet troops died in Afghanistan. Uh, many, many, many more Afghans will never know the true amount, uh, the true death toll from that era, probably at least half a million. But you had situations where Soviet troops would, you know, um, desecrate mosques and so on, and it spread resentment. But I see a lot of um, things going on now, a lot of uh, whataboutery, a lot of gloating, frankly. And there's some outright falsehoods being put out there. One of them is that the West created the Taliban. Now, what actually happened was in the 1980s, uh, the West, bear in mind this was the Cold War, the West funded the Mujahideen. And there's those famous images of President Reagan meeting the Mujahideen. The Mujahideen were religious. They weren't as extreme as the Taliban. What happened was in the 1990s when the Soviets left and Afghanistan broke into civil war. Some Mujahideen became Taliban, i.e. the religious hardline um, movement, and some became um, Northern Alliance and other uh, other groups. So this idea the West created the Taliban is um, it's just not accurate. I mean, not as a policy matter. The West funded the Mujahideen. Whether that was the right decision or not, we can argue about, but let's be clear about it. It was the Mujahideen, not the Taliban. The Taliban came later. Um, why does that matter? It matters because there are people out there, I believe, who don't really give a damn about the Afghan people. Or well, maybe they do, but the main motivation is an anti-Western worldview. This is quite a broad umbrella of people. It goes from hostile foreign governments like the Russian government, who will be gloating about this, China as well. And China's role is, you know, China is definitely going to have some stake in this. For all their talk about not interfering in other countries' internal affairs, you can be sure that Beijing is looking at the situation very closely. Afghanistan is a Central Asian country. Um, they will see uh, possibly the Taliban, Islamist extremists as they are, um, as possibly a useful bulwark against ISIS. And purely from a practical point of view, you can sort of see Beijing's logic in that. Although it's ironic that they're um, incarcerating thousands and thousands of Uyghur Muslims on the grounds of supposedly preventing Islamic extremism, and yet they're talking to the Taliban. You know, senior Taliban officials have met Chinese officials in Beijing. So... Uh, China's role in all of this is quite murky, and certainly um, they have an interest. But getting back to this umbrella, you have uh, forces in the West as well. You have the likes of the Stop the War Coalition, which uh, present themselves as a pacifist group, but they're only interested in criticising Western foreign policy. So they were fiercely critical of Bush and Blair over Iraq. Um, that's fine. But they extend that to Afghanistan. And this is a point I want to make. Um, 
A lot of people make this lazy argument that Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria and Libya and every conflict that the West has somehow been involved in is all one and the same. This is one of the biggest misconceptions about this. Let's flash back to 2001. After September 11th, the fact of the matter is the Taliban gave Al-Qaeda safe haven. Now, no one seriously disputes that. Um, you might have some conspiracy theorists will argue against that, but most people accept that there is some truth in that. It, well, that, that is that is the reality. So um, the Bush administration um, saw that. And I'm, uh, I'm not a fan of President Bush. I think he made some very, very deep mistakes and moral moral uh, mistakes as well in his presidency. Iraq was an absolute catastrophe because, as President Obama pointed out, one thing Iraq done was distract the Americans from Afghanistan. And although the American military is huge and it can fight two wars at once, the point is, I think there was a complacency about Afghanistan when the Taliban initially fell. But of course, that was bubbling away in the background. Iraq then became the main conflict and the whole focus was on Iraq. But people conveniently forget the differences in, in the conflict. In both cases, you have Western intervention. But in the case of Afghanistan, there was broad UN support for intervention. Even China and Russia were not vocally opposing some sort of intervention in Afghanistan in 2001. This is extremely important because today Moscow and Beijing are quoting about the West failure in Afghanistan, but in 2001 they were not opposing, certainly not to the same extent as Iraq, intervention of some kind. Now we can argue about what went wrong, we can argue about what the West should have done better, but I do think it's very important not to just lump these two conflicts as one and the same. Of course, one of the people who do lump them together was President Bush, because he put them both as, you know, it was one of the biggest flaws of the Bush presidency to link Iraq to 9-11, and uh, Saddam was a brutal dictator, but there was minimal connection with 9-11, there was no weapons of mass destruction. It was an absolute catastrophe. I still think the removal of Saddam in itself was not a bad thing. This was a genocidal tyrant. But it did cause years of violence and instability, which still isn't entirely gone. Um, but, you know, I get frustrated when I see people saying, oh, the West is Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria. Well, that just shows an ignorance because, again, in Libya, you had a situation where people were being slaughtered by Gaddafi. And they pleaded for outside intervention. That's a fact. David Cameron and Nicolas Sarkozy were literally cheered in Benghazi. That's a fact. As for Syria, how anyone could say that Syria is the same situation as Iraq or Afghanistan is the only connection it has is like Iraq, it's a Middle Eastern country. And like Iraq, it became a very brutal and bloody war. But the West did not start the war in Syria. Bashar Assad started a war in Syria with his brutal crushing of legitimate protests. Protests over unemployment, human rights abuses, inflation, etc. Syrians were fed up. And, um, of course, Russia got involved. Russia, and to a lesser extent, China propped up the Assad regime. ISIS then took advantage of the situation. And uh, you had a prolonged conflict. But again, this gets distorted. The West created ISIS. The argument for that is um, those connections at best. There was never ever a Western policy to create ISIS. I mean, does that make sense? That the West, as a matter of state policy, would create a vicious Islamist group that would target the West? Would that make any sense? And I don't really accept, oh, well, it's uh, to justify foreign wars, because if you have terrorist attacks in Western cities, then leaders can justify foreign wars. But that's not the case because actually what you have is more cynicism especially when you have the power of russian state media which is why i despise rt because they, they make so many uh, distortions to the reality i mean i think it's a disgrace that ofcom still sits on the fence about that i mean it's ridiculous they talk about the need for impartiality 
in the British Code of Ethical Code of Conduct of Journalism, RTs violated all of that. Yet the most they get is a fine. It's it actually really pisses me off. Um, but I believe getting back to Afghanistan, like I say, there will be hostile foreign powers that gloat over this. There will be um, there'll be some domestic for uh, there'll be domestic powers as well. I mean, Donald Trump come out and demand that Biden resigns. This is so, so rich of him because Donald Trump was talking about an even earlier withdrawal. I mean, this is pure, um, this just shows what sort of man Donald Trump is. A complete and utter charlatan. A complete and utter, this is a man devoid of any morals because he will say anything to his base. He's looking at the White House and 2020, um, 2024. Um, so, you know, Biden's a failure. Let's attack Joe Biden. Donald Trump would have done exactly the same thing. So any Trump supporters out there, criticise Biden, fine, but just don't think that Donald Trump would be any better. I, I just think that is the most pathetic form of partisan politics for Trump to do that, knowing full well that he would have done the same thing, but even earlier. And Donald Trump, don't forget, was talking to the Taliban. So um, I just think there is a lot of, uh, in this current situation, with this chaotic situation, with this Taliban takeover, a lot of people are making sweeping statements. A lot of people are saying it's a total failure of Western foreign policy. Is it? Now, hear me out here. Um, it's very difficult to see optimism from this. It is. Because the regime that was in power in the beginning is back in power. And the Taliban assurances count for very little because so far the record has been somewhat mixed. They've sort of grudgingly allowed women to get back to work, but, you know, with the mandate that they wear hijabs. Um, the shops in Kabul apparently a more fashionable items have uh, greatly reduced and more conservative items have went on sale, so there's clearly fear. Some brutal reports emerging of things happening to women and others. Um, so I don't think the Taliban can be trusted in that regard. And that's why it's so worrying for many Afghans. But thinking in, if you like, a selfish point of view from, from the Western campaign in Afghanistan, the initial aim was to catch or kill Osama bin Laden. Well, that happened. Bin Laden was killed in 2011. Uh, it was a direct response to 9-11. And the fact of the matter is there has not been a terror attack on the scale of 9-11 in the United States in the last 20 years. It's been plots. Um, but not on that scale. So in that sense, in terms of the initial mission goal, so to speak, it was a success. And that sounds really almost flippant or hollow because the current situation is so bad but that has to be recognized the tragedy with afghanistan is all the gains that were made the rights of women and girls you know girls going to school women standing in parliament for example a lot of that's going to be stripped back and that is an utter, utter tragedy but is it right to totally blame the west for that I think there'll be a lot of questions over exactly what happened. Why was the Taliban advanced so fast? Why did the Afghan army capitulate? Was it a case that there were many defections? Was it a case that there was very low morale in the Afghan forces? I don't want to question the individual courage of Afghan troops. That would be wrong. Because these are men that have paid with their lives in many cases, in the thousands. Far more than British and American forces and Canadian. Um, so it would be wrong to question the courage, but I think it's valid to ask what happened here. Why was that advance so sudden? I think Biden is wrong to be flippant in his attitude in terms of he's got no responsibility. That's absurd. Of course he's got responsibility. This is a presidential decision that he made, and he has to take ownership of that. By the way, to Trump fans, even CNN was criticising Biden in that sense. Uh, I'll run this up soon, but um, what's Afghanistan going to be like in 10 years? 
are we about to see a period now which is echoing that 1996 to 2001 period where Afghanistan was basically a theocratic hell, where music was banned, dancing was banned, women were stoned to death in Ghazni Stadium, um, men were hanged if their beard wasn't the right length. Will it be that bad? I don't know. The only thing with that is even the Taliban, now that they're governing the country, they'll need outside investment. They might be bad, but they're not stupid. They'll need outside investment. Afghanistan is a country that has serious poverty. It's a country that uh, suffers natural disasters. There was deadly floods earlier this year. And of course, there's uh, decades of conflict. So this is a country that really is um, will need to be built from scratch in many ways. So that's the responsibility of the Taliban. They're the government now. And they will have to show that they are governing. It might be a hideous form of government, but nevertheless, they are the government. So that's what I'm considering, that they know they will need outside investment. It's not a country like China is going to care about human rights. They don't. But I do think a very small part of me wonders if this Taliban or this particular era might be a little... I mean, I, I'm even reluctant to say that because it sounds flippant. I was going to say if this particular era will be a little bit more moderate, if they won't be quite as dogmatic as they were in the, that 1996 to 2001 period. The, uh, the Taliban has lost thousands of fighters. Um, and although they're battle hardened, I imagine they would want stability as well to an extent. They probably know that there will be insurgencies growing against them if they you know, make themselves so unpopular that, uh, that they will want to keep their power. So there's a small, small possibility they will be forced to moderate in that sense. Because if they don't, they know that, you know, the people will just reject them. And um, there's already signs, like I say, of an anti-Taliban insurgency in Pangaea. So it's be interesting to see how that develops. Morally speaking, I'm 100% with people of Pangaea and anyone who stands up to the Taliban. But at the same time, you know, Afghanistan needs peace. So uh, I'm going to round this up, but uh, I'm not saying that the West shouldn't be criticised. That is not what I'm saying. I think that the Iraq war uh, distracted from this. I think that um, probably there could have been more of a focus on human rights as opposed to just a mission goal. But I also think that there's a lot of distortion going on right now. And there are hostile forces. There's foreign governments. There's also forces in the West that will blame the West no matter what. I can understand a soldier um, feeling utterly disillusioned and angry and disheartened by the situation. I mean, if I'd risked my life fighting a, a force that just got back into power... And I felt that, you know, Western leadership helped that to happen by pulling out so rapidly. I'd probably be very angry. But, you know, the Daily Mail had a big glaring headline, what the, hell were they, what the hell were we there for? That's an example of the sort of hyperbole. And you're seeing it on both left and right. Well, again, we were there as a response to 9-11. At least that's why the Americans were there. A response to 9-11. By the way, 67 Britons died in that event. So we also had a vested interest. This I, I, I get frustrated with this sort of sweeping statement and the Daily Mail is very good at doing that. Why the hell were we there? They really, really play up to emotions rather than... Um, it's one of the reasons I'm quite critical of the Daily Mail. I believe they pander more to emotions rather than real politic. You know, that's a sweeping statement. Why were we there? Well, that's why. A direct response to 9-11. I think it's a dangerous worldview to just dismiss every um, Western foreign policy as, oh, it's about resources. I mean, that's one thing about Afghanistan. It can't be said, oh, it's all about oil, because Afghanistan doesn't, is not a major oil producer. There will be some people, no matter what the situation, they will always, always uh, find a way to say, 
it's just because of this reason or it's just because of that reason. And maybe it is. Maybe there are selfish intentions in this foreign policy. But if you are of the worldview that it can all be blamed on the West without attributing any sort of um, any responsibility to the Afghan government, or if you're of the worldview that nothing should have happened in 2001, because there's people now say, oh, we told you should, so we shouldn't have gone in. Really? So was it really a viable option for President Bush in 2001 to have done nothing? I think that's ridiculous. I think had Bush done nothing, he would have been seen as weak. He would have been dismissed as a weak, uh, incompetent leader who failed to act against the worst terror attack in modern world history, an attack that killed thousands of American citizens. So, of course, Bush had to act. I mean, no president, to be fair to Bush, no president faced that situation, an attack on that scale, domestically. Pearl Harbor was a major event, but it was not even on the US mainland. So President Bush faced a unique challenge. And I think the idea that he should have done nothing is just not believable. It's just not a practical, you know, going back to late 2001, that just was not an option. And I just think it's useful that people remember that when the likes of the Daily Mail said, what the hell were we there for? That's why. Anyway, I'll round this up. Uh, that, that's my take. Um, I just think there's a lot of thing, a lot of sweeping statements being made. No, the West did not create the Taliban, um, and I do not believe that this was a totally punitive war. All war is bad. People die, and you know it's easy for me to say that in the comfort of the United Kingdom. But I don't agree with these sweeping statements that it was all for nothing in the sense of there being no mission goal or there being no initiative for being there. That's just a totally um, sweeping statement, and it's not an accurate one. Let me know your thoughts. Uh, I know this is an emotive subject, but please keep it civil. Um, if you're Afghan, I'd like to hear your perspective. Um, I'm just an observer. I, I'm not a soldier. I'm not a journalist yet. I haven't been to Afghanistan. I'm not claiming to be an expert. I'm only looking at this situation and in my view, there are misconceptions going on, but, you know, I haven't been there. If I was a soldier, maybe I'd have a very different perspective and I've, I have no right to question them and I won't. But this is just my take on the situation. And it definitely will be one of the big defining points of the Biden presidency and he will have to live with that. This is the weight of leadership. Biden will have to live with that decision. Um, but the alternative was staying in Afghanistan. Well, the question then is, for how long? So Biden's getting fierce criticism from left and right at the moment. But the alternative was staying in Afghanistan. Then the question is, how long?